Okay, so we're going to walk through uh, section 9.2, um, which looks at estimating population means. So in 9.1, we looked at how that worked for proportions, and we're just going to expand that same idea to how it works for means. So we're going to use a little bit of what we talked about there, but we're also going to use what we used back in chapter 8 and chapter 7. So just to review, right, we talked in chapter 8 about this idea that when we have a sample mean, it's just one of many possible sampling means. And if you think about the whole population of means, which is a weird thing to say, um, that can actually define the distribution pretty well. So if we could take a whole bunch of samples, we could really figure out what the mean and standard deviation and all those kind of things are gonna look like. Of course, in practice, we don't do that because that's not how um, the world works, but this idea that we could think about it that way in order to understand things a little bit better. So. The idea that the mean of the average of the sampling distribution, right? So the mean of the means is itself the true mean. And that's maybe not very interesting and certainly weird to say. What was funnier though, was that the sample size that we used for those sample means influenced um, how we estimated the true mean. So there's the true standard deviation. So the standard deviation of the sample mean was the true standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And again, that's sort of weird, but it's how it works out. And then the third point, which is kind of important, is this idea that if the population itself is normal, or if our sample size is sufficiently large, and remember 30 is enough for that, then the distribution of this mean is going to be normal, so we can treat it as normal. So we could think about this idea that, you know, 95% of the means fall in this range, and we could calculate it going out there. And you remember 1.96 was the idea of how much fits inside 95% that plus or minus two standard deviations gives us the middle 95%. All right, so following those same ideas, we could calculate confidence intervals on the mean the same as we did for the standard deviation, or as we say as we did for proportions. And so that idea that just like we had p hat plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of the thingy. That's what we're doing here. And again, sigma uh, of the sample mean is that uh, calculation that we'll get to here in a second. So there we go. There's a problem though. And the problem is that this assumes that we know what the standard deviation is, right? The standard deviation of the sampling mean of the sample mean uses the true value of the standard deviation, but we don't know what the true value of this, we don't know what the true mean is. How would we know what the true standard deviation is? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate this by S. So instead of using this true magical pure standard deviation, we're gonna use the one we have for the data we have. But by introducing that imperfect estimate, we're adding more error into our model. So the model itself is gonna be more varied because we want to account for the additional uh, variation that the standard deviation is going to add into our model. So perfectly normal if we knew what the standard deviation is, but since it's not, we're going to use S instead and it adds extra variation to it. We call this the student T distribution and um, later on I'll, I'll share a video where I'll tell the story of students T, but it's a good story. It involves beer, which is kind of cool. Um, William Seeley Gossett was the guy uh, who did that. And um, the idea is that the T distribution is mostly like the Z. It's unimodal, so it has one bump in the middle. It's symmetric, just like standard normal, but its tails are going to be a little bit wider, a little bit fatter than um, the standard normal distribution. More than that, it's going to depend on the sample size. So the bigger our sample size, the more T is going to look like Z. And if we have enough, we can actually just go ahead and use Z anyway, even though it's not a perfect measure. So if I bring uh, this uh, chart in, what we can see is that here's our 1.96, which would be the exact right Z number that we would use. But if our sample size is small, say degrees of freedom is six, which means our sample size is seven, then instead of 1.96, we have to use 2.45 which makes our confidence interval wider because that value is not there. If our sample size is smaller still, degrees of freedom equals three, which means our sample size is four, then we have to go fatter still and we get that it's 3.18 instead. Now, if your sample size is pretty big, 
you're like, yeah, close enough. And in fact, right around 100, we start to say, oh, maybe we don't care as much and we can just go ahead and just use 1.96 1 1 anyway. But unlike things like that n bigger than 30 is big enough, for t, 30 still isn't enough that we could just use 1.96 and not worry about it anymore. Okay, and so this idea that we're gonna have a confidence interval just like we had before, but instead of uh, z, we're gonna have t, and instead of sigma or the proportion that we had before, we're gonna use this s. And in fact, some people write it as s squared over n square rooted, and I like that because it looks like the proportion formula, but you know, square root of s squared is s, so that's true. So this idea that we're gonna have this formula, right, and it's still gonna work the same, we have the critical value that we get from a table, although for 95%, it's gonna be just a little bit more than 1.96. StatCrunch is gonna calculate it for us or the spreadsheet will calculate it for us, but there's a table that has those numbers. We're still gonna have the mean, the sample mean, and then we're still gonna have the margin of error, which is all of the, oh, I'm bad at drawing. We're still gonna have the margin of error, which is this whole amount, right? We have a point estimate over here, margin of error, and then we have the standard error, which is just s over square root of n. Okay, and again, times the critical value, which is now based off t instead of z. So we're gonna have plus or minus, and that's gonna give us a confidence interval. Now we can use the t table to find the values. And again, we're not gonna do that in this class. We're gonna use StatCrunch to calculate that for us, or we're gonna use a spreadsheet to do that. But you could see here's our degrees of freedom. And so we're saying if you had, you know, sample size of 15, you would do a degrees of freedom of 14. And if you wanted to do um, 0.025 for 95% confidence interval, you just look here and get the 2.15 number. But again, we're not gonna do that in the class. Um, in the activity this week, we're doing that a little bit. Um, okay, so here's an example. So suppose we surveyed 61 Truman students and we found that um, on average, um, the relationship length was 28 months and it had a standard deviation of 25 months. Notice that that's um, pretty big, so it's going to tell us the confidence interval, and uh, we can go ahead and calculate it from there. And so we just plug those numbers into the formula. We do have to find t, which for 60 is actually right at 2.0, which is handy. One reason why we make examples with 61 students in it. Um, and we can calculate that amount. So here it's just algebra, plug in x bar find that number from the table and then calculate the standard error, right? Square root of 61 is a pain to calculate, but you know, we know how to do that. So then we're gonna go ahead and, oh, this is just doing it again. Um, so this is the one um, where the distribution isn't gonna be normal because the standard deviation isn't there. I forgot, I'm stuck in a trick question. So that's good. Okay, so just a little bit more here. So the confidence interval width, um, which is the margin of error, Right, so you're just gonna have a margin of error on the plus side and a margin of error on the last side. We can call that E, and instead of saying plus or minus uh, the whole thing, we can just say, go back to here, there we go. Instead of saying X bar plus or minus this whole thing, we can just say plus or minus E, and that way we can think about error in a new way. When you think about error, that's the thing we wanna control. So this idea that we wanna make the confidence interval narrower, right, because we wanna get a better guess, the only thing you can change is the level of confidence or the sample size. So we can either get more people in our study or we can say, well, if I'm less sure, we can get a tighter bound on that error. We can do another thing, which is we can take that uh, formula and solve it for E. So instead of saying, uh, you know, mu equals, x bar plus or minus uh, e, um, we can uh, solve for it. And if we do that, we can get n out of the calculation. So right, all we did is we took this calculation that e is equal to 2 t s over n, solve for n, square both sides, algebra, algebra, algebra. And we can get this formula, which we can use to say, well, if we want an error of about um, e, and we think we know what the standard deviation is, we could calculate what it is. Now it's Z and not T because we're gonna guess, we're gonna assume we know what the value is. But again, the whole thing's a guess, so sticking in that little extra variation is fine. Of course, you can't find T without knowing N and the whole purpose is to find N we get in a loop. Um, we'd end up in a black hole or something. But we could use this formula to find that out. So if we did have an example 
we could uh, calculate that all through. So again, this uh, section is calculation heavy, but not really um, super hard. So let me bring back my uh, thing over here. So here is um, the data we had from before. So this is just the height and uh, oops, the height and weight data that we used uh, from lab zero, right? So we had about 20 some points um, in our data set, 22 points for our heights. We had data from both men and women. If I want to make a confidence interval on that, I can just go right here to T stats, do this and say with data, and then say I want to make a confidence interval at 95% on the weight, I'm sorry, the height, whichever one you click, and you go ahead and click OK, and it's going to calculate it for you. So here's our sample mean. Standard error, remember, is S over square root of N. Degrees of freedom was 22 minus 1 is 21. And then here is our lower and upper confidence interval. Now, one thing that's cool is if we were thinking that, well, we want to treat men and women as separate because we know the heights of men and women is different, we can go here into the summary. Oops, not that one. We can go in here to T stats one sample with data. And we can say we want to look at height. We want to group it by gender. And we're going to make our confidence interval for that. And it's going to go ahead and just make the confidence interval for the men and the women separately. Notice the degrees of freedom are lower because each of the sample sizes are smaller as we do that. And we can get our upper and lower confidence interval on each. And notice that our mean height is about five inches different between men and women, same as we did in the lab. And the confidence intervals are a little bit different. The females actually have a little bit narrower uh, bound, not just because their standard deviation is lower, but because their sample size is bigger. And so, again, the theory of a t-test is, is fairly interesting and fairly cool. The formula itself is just arithmetic to do, and you can do it by hand, but with a tool like StatCrunch or a spreadsheet, we can actually do it pretty quickly. So here is um, one more of those, and I was just going to take the data off of uh, this and just show you how it looks here by itself. So if we do our summary stats, or a column and we do the height, oops, I'm sorry, we do the height by gender and we get that our mean uh, height for women was 64 and a half with standard deviation 2.74 and our mean was 64.5, oops, 64.5 here, our standard, our N was 12. So I'm going to copy that over here. And here's how we would do it wrong if we treated it as a Z. So again, we took our alpha over 2. Um, the command is T inv, just like we did norms inv back in chapter 7. T inv gives us the value from the T table. We calculate our, our S. I guess we had that before. Divided by square root of N. Math, math, math. We got our T number. And that is our margin of error. So we just take our mean plus or minus that. So now the average for 12 women, according to our data, is between 62 and 66, 62 and a half and 66 and a half. Now, if instead of using our T, we use Z, so we stuck in 1.96 when we shouldn't have, our bound would have been 63 to 66. So it's off by about a half an inch in both directions. Now, for the height of people, maybe a half inch isn't a big deal. But if you were building a bridge or working a rocket ship or doing one of those things, the difference between Z and T could be enough between, you know, hitting the target or missing it. So this idea that using T instead of Z is actually really helpful and it gives us much better estimates as we're calculating things. Okay, so that is um, chapter 9.2. It gives us sort of this introduction to uh, confidence intervals for means. Um, we'll be coming to hypothesis tests a little bit later. One quick note, section 9.3, I'm not making a video for, because that's really just asking you to pick between proportions and means. So it's really just about recognizing which story you're in. So you can go ahead and read the book and do the homework for that, but I don't have a separate video for that. So, okay.